All right. I'm National Master Jesse Cohen. And let's find the right plan. In order to find the right plan, Chess, it's all about recognizing what you have that's different. Jeremy Summon calls us imbalances, but also seeing which ones you can actually make use of. There's going to be lots of imbalances or differences in any position, and you can't make use of all of it. Um, in this position, what does white have that's advantageous? Well, most of our pieces are just better than theirs. Um, our rooks occupy a beautiful open diagonal where they have some possible future penetration points that could be good. Our bishop is phenomenal. Nice diagonal and pressure and pins compared to the opposing one on c8. Um, these knights all kind of seem the same, but realistically, whites are better because A, since the queen is the only thing defending e5, this is creating more pressure against e, uh, black. And um, since this knight really would love to jump into this uh, outpost, and neither of these pieces really have any outpost to jump into from here. Uh, they definitely seem more like they're defending. Anyways, like the only piece that's actually... <clears throat> I slaughter puppies. What's up? Welcome. Uh, finding the right plan. What's up with you? Um, yeah, so... I don't know, there's lots of ways you can improve your position here. Uh, I believe that Botfinick uh, Botf chooses uh, Queen e3. It was the only piece uh, just hanging out nice. Same. Same. Um, since this was the only piece that Black has that's worse than us, we go ahead and offer a trade. Of course, there's calculation backing this up. I know that it creates double isolated pawns. But white gets the attack, even after they take, and of course we take back, because what else are we going to do? Now we have threats, right? We are immediately threatening pawn on e5. Maybe it's not so easy to guard that. Either way, everything that we do in a chess position should either be about creating good things for us that the opponent doesn't have or making use of it so either creating good things or making use of good things again white is hoping to make use of the fact not not even hoping trying to make use of the fact that uh white's pieces are way better the team like white's team is just ready to go bishop g4 hitting the knight to the rook trying to play active and avoiding this how should we play? Typically in chess, you want to look at the forceful moves first. And uh, just kind of see what they do. In this position, uh, I think white has this move a5. And it's not just about attacking the knight. It's about what does black play. It seems like black has to either bring that knight back to d7 or c8, both of which are less good than the knight on b6. Remember, the way you play against knights is to drive them backwards, so this is pretty good. Drive them backwards. c8, kind of a weird choice. Looks like that uh, wants to go to e7 and c6, perhaps. Um, still pitting that knight to the rook. We've got to find a way here. Like, like I can't stress this enough. Pretend that you're white right now, okay? Look at your position. You should think to yourself, I like my position. It's better. The reason that it's better is because my pieces are ready to go and attack better than my opponent. Therefore, I need to come up with a way to attack them. Um, at the moment, we have, like, like we have to, like, pick a good target. I'm like noticing all sorts of potential targets, mostly pawns, of course. 
Um, unfortunately, like targeting this pawn, like we can never get to like D7, it seems. They have way too much coverage. It's like we have this open file, but like we need to penetrate or attack something. We can't get to D5, D6, D7. And if we play Rook D8, it doesn't even threaten anything. They can just like play 97 or something. So, better move here. Rook C1. The idea behind this move is we are renewing the threat to the pawn in E5. And we are trying to move our knight on C3, which could maybe make a Rook C7. Like, we've got we've to gotta find a, a plan that's going to get our pieces into prime positioning, like into the opponent's territory. So we can cause some serious, serious damage. Bishop takes f3, of course, just take back. Knight, e7. Again, put yourself in white shoes. What do you do? Your pieces are more active, but it's not going to last much longer. They are about to challenge. They're about to challenge these open files. I think it's finally time. The time has come. Knight d5. Knight a4, maybe? Knight a4 is not bad. Um, a lot of people would probably argue that it's putting a knight on the rim, but since it's immediately going to come back into like c5 or b6, actually, I don't think it's that bad. Um, if I do have a problem with it at all, it's that it's not forceful enough. Since it doesn't actually give any threats or immediate pressure to the opponent, it gives them kind of a free hand. And our, ad our advantage is like rapidly deteriorating. Like we have to, we have to like keep the threats alive. Otherwise it just, it all goes away. So I think he actually does go for knight d5 in this position. Um, <clears throat> I mean, obviously we're threatening the knight and they don't have to take it. But if they do take it, we get a really nice pass pawn, so that could be good. Um, and if he doesn't take it, which I, I think he doesn't take it, then it gives us an opportunity to still stay active. Like again, like in this position, like I think maybe this might be one of the most important things in chess. I know this is there's advanced levels to this, but let's just keep it simple. For you as the player to realize what your advantage is and then to energetically come up with ideas to make use of it, to play and like be like, my advantage is blank. I know that because of that, I'm supposed to kind of do these type of things. And then you try your best to do those type of things. And as you, as you uh, practice it, of course, you'll get better like anything else. You got to be patient with yourself. So again, the advantage that we have right now is that we have more activated pieces and we have a bishop. So we are trying to look at all of our rooks, bishops, and knight to look at like any active thing we can come up with here. Um, in this position, even though our knight on d5 is better than their knight, the fact that we can play knight takes knight check and finally sink a knight or sink a rook into d7, I think this is the way. Again, it took long enough. We didn't get here the way we wanted to get here. Ideally, we did not want to trade so many pieces. But we finally found a way to penetrate into the position and apply pressure to the opponent. Um, Rook b8. Yo, Ice, what would you play here as white? Again, you've got the more active rooks and bishop. You have the more active pieces. Either we need to keep using those pieces to apply pressure and harm to the opponent, or we have to kind of come up with some, some way to cash that in, I suppose. Right? Like, again, if I was going to make chess really, really simple, chess is about, like, the opening. If you, did, if you did the opening right, you created something your opponent didn't have, some sort of advantage. And if you do the middle game right, then you use that advantage, you kind of build it up, and you use it to hurt your opponent. 
And if you do it well, you hurt, you hurt your opponent enough that eventually they have to, like, start losing stuff or get checkmated. And that's, that's where, you know, that's tactics and combinations at a high level kind of finish that stuff off. Probably Rook D8. Oh, no, it's, uh... Rook D8 or Rook G. You mean white plays Rook D8? Rook D1. Ah. So... Like, I like the idea of doubling. However, everything we do has to have some sort of purpose. Maybe this rook could come down here and create more pressure. Um, white comes up with a way to keep more attack on the opponent and plays this weird move, king f2. Do you see the threat behind this uh, move? I mean, like, white's like, hey, it's an end game, and in the end game, my king should be active. But this actually has a threat behind it. Something Bothanik has done really well is just keep keep the keep attacking black and keep black off balance on the defense. Keep him defending, keep him passive, keep him scrambling. And so this this does create a threat. Surprisingly. I think the threat here is, uh, well, it is, it is to give a check, but like if we give the check, like let's just say they play no move and we play rook g1 check, it would force them off the f pawn so we could take it with the bishop. Knight takes a5. You could play rook g1 check and do that right now, but it is way too irresistible to play this move. I like to keep chess as simple as I possibly can. Complicated things have happened, moves that were unexpected have happened, yada, yada, yada. But th at the end of the day, if we were going to tell a very basic story of what White did, White, crea White created a position where White had more active pieces. Then White made a plan to use those active pieces to can, like, quickly and consistently create attacks and pressure on the opponent until we can convert that to something more tangible, like a piece or some sort of checkmate or something like that. I mean, at this point, F7 is going to die. So at this point, black does what black should probably do, and that's try to trade off pieces. I love this position because even though so many pieces have traded off, white still hasn't lost the, the advantage. The advantage is still my pieces are active than yours. Uh, my, the bishop is going to be better than the knight. Obviously, the rook is better than the rook. And because of this little conundrum, black can't even activate the king in this endgame. That's like being down a piece. Um, it's really bad. There's a lot of moves that white could play here, realistically. Um, I, think, I think he plays like bishop d5. Just why not? Centralizes the bishop, corrals the knight. And tempts black to play the following move, which was really bad. B5. The reason this move is bad is that if white... So, you know, typically when, we're do, when we, feel, or we uh, figure out an advantage and we start playing for it, um, we kind of just can focus on making ours better. Like, how do I make my pieces as active as they can be? How do I use them to attack? But sometimes we have the ability to do the other side of the coin because white's advantage is a comparison between how active white's pieces are compared to how inactive black's pieces are. And in this position, white has a really, really cute move here, b3. The only purpose is that black now has uh, no way to do anything with that knight. We can't actually win the knight, unfortunately. If we try to, black has the rook to help it escape. But that rook, that knight is now out of commission. So basically now the knight is out of commission, that king is out of commission, and black's rook is just kind of 
sliding around trying to figure something out, it's pretty bad. If you ever get a position like this, uh, you should be really proud of yourself. You should feel very, very lucky and fortunate. And the reason why is that um, your opponent has gotten to a position so bad that all they can really do is waste time and, and hope that you can't figure out a way to win. Um, because in moments like these, you have all the time in the world to just slowly build up your position. So if I remember correctly, I think like Black's like, or White's like, you know, how do I, I can do everything I want to maximize my position because Black has no way to make progress. So might as well activate the king, right? Let's make some winning ideas, maybe like king g4, f5, g6, that we like can mate them really quickly, rook h7 mate, all sorts of things. Here, obviously taking would lose a bishop. I mean, you could still consider it if you think the, the pawn is fast enough, but I just don't believe it is. Um, King h4. Let's keep going. They take. This one is a toughie. Okay? A lot of times, and I still think, I mean, uh, I mean, it's the b3 pawn. It's the fact that the d file is still closed. It's mostly the b3 pawn. Otherwise, bishop takes is probably better for the pawn structure. Either way, white is okay taking on this pawn structure because we understand that our advantage is mostly in peace activity. And now black is like, how do I not lose a pawn and not get mated? And I'm pretty sure if we mess around with them enough, um, we will be able to slowly but surely... Was it not that? We'll be able to slowly but surely put pressure on all these major weaknesses. A6, E5, H6. And eventually, we'll find a way to weasel in. I believe it was in this position that Grandmaster Sorokin resigned with no way to defend um, the e5 pawn uh, except for knight c6, which would allow, unfortunately, rook e6, pinning the knight and winning an entire piece. Uh, Sorokin resigns. Again, um, a beautiful example of it, just I have very active pieces. That's my advantage. That is not going to last forever. I need to use my active pieces and do whatever I can to keep that difference so that my pieces equal better than blacks. So whether it's trading off my less active pieces for yours, whether it is driving your pieces backward into passivity, whether it is using my active pieces to... Uh, keep initiative on you. I just keep plowing away and I keep my eye on the prize. I'm not going to get into advanced concepts of like, you know, it, it will come up sometimes where you can trade off one advantage for another, but that's definitely more complicated. It's better to just start simple. Focus on building something up and what you can do with it, right? Next. You still with me, Ice? Was that decent? I'm trying to be helpful here. Hopefully it's helpful. I try to be helpful in a way that's easy to understand, somewhat relatable, stuff like that. Here, how about you saw this one? It's white to move. What is... Uh, in this position, white has an edge here. There's definitely something about white that is better than black. Do you know what I'm talking about? Compare white and black's position. Is there anything that you think is superior about white's position compared with black? Like, here's one thing. I don't think it's a huge thing. But white's queen, I think, is better placed than black's queen. Not a huge thing, because they're pretty close. But 
It's a bit better. Noobston, welcome. Central position. I would basically say, yeah, it's it's a it's a combination of central position and space. Um, Silman has all these different categories for advantages, and if you watch enough videos, you'll hear about them. But um, one advantage in chess is who has pawns advanced the furthest, and if it's in the center, especially since the center is the most important part of the board, then that's like you know big news. Um, what's the you know what's the point? What does it do? Um, if you compare uh, white central pawn e4 with the black center pawn on d6 um, and you really think about how this impacts white's army and black's army respectively you should probably eventually notice that white's pieces have more room to move than black's pieces I mean pretty obviously that is blocking that and true this is blocking this you're a very uh, astute a uh, person who's watching the knight can move very easily to a square that's safe um whereas this is definitely not a safe move so i suppose white can free this bishop very nicely black can't so just like anything else in chess if you want to make a good plan you need to try and create or make use of something good that your opponent doesn't have. In this case, white has more space. The advantage this gives us is we got more room to move our pieces and they have less room to move their pieces. So literally what white does in this game is white tries to A, increase the advantage by finding more opportunities slowly to push pawns and gain more space suffocating black. The other thing is that we are going to take away squares that could be useful from Black's pieces. Remember, like right now, Black, because they have less space, they don't have as much room to move around. And so, you know, for example, like, if you just like put yourself in Black's shoes, and you're like, okay, what would I play if I was Black? Okay. One move might be Knight G4. Go forward, attack the rook, stuff like that. Which is why this first move might seem weird, but it's just h3. Knight d5, by the way, I, uh, not a bad move. The reason that knight d5 might not be played right away is that it might allow queen takes uh, c2. Um, but also, well... It, it might allow this move. Um, it, in this position, white doesn't want to swap pieces. Um, I guess that was the, the third thing I should have told you. When you have an advantage in space, which is I have a pawn further push than you do, I want to A, push more pawns. So like I, I want to play like C4, maybe F4, G4, who knows what. As long as I can get away with it, that's going to be good. I want to... Take away squares from your pieces. Moves like h3, so you can't play knight g4. Stuff like that. And third, I don't want to swap pieces with you. Because part of the problem is you got all these pieces trying to move around in this little scrunched area. And if I let you trade off some pieces, then you don't have so many things running into each other. It's actually better that I let you keep pieces on the board so they keep bumping into each other. Hey, Han. Dot. Han? Queen c2 doesn't work. Um, Queen C2 actually prob well I mean Rook C1. This might get complicated. The queen might just be trapped. Um, so I think it's it's probably more likely knight takes here. I know that this seems really silly because pawn takes look like it forks both of these, but I think this works as an in-between move because we're threatening mate. And if they take again, we could play queen beat d7 if we want to, or we could still take yet again because they still can't take our queen due to mate. And then we could finally, like, uh, either win a pawn there or finally take here. 
So actually, if we do all that, I think this goes way better for us. And not notice again, notice how much black feels better here with all the pieces off. Because even though white has a space advantage, we don't have a bunch of pieces jumbled up trying to figure our way out, right? So let's go back. Again, H3 seems like a, a gentle little move, but it is a simple but slow. This is the best way I can describe it. There are different advantages in chess. If uh, space advantage was um, a predator in the wild, it would be a boa constrictor because it is going to slowly suffocate you. Um, if you really want a lot of good examples of how to suffocate your opponent, check out Dr. Tarash. Probably one of the most underrated players of all time. He, if he had a, a real rating, like if he was like alive today and playing amongst us with a real rating, he'd be over 2,700, I'm almost positive. He was, he was, oh my gosh, amazing. Anyway, let's continue forward. Queen B6. Class, have you been paying attention? Should white allow a queen trade? No. Sorry. Had to do it. We should not allow the queen trade. Because again, black is cramped. So let's just play something reasonable and not trade queens. Okay? On to c6. You know, we got to realize our opponent's ideas as well. They want to play d5 if they can get away with it. This would allow them to A, challenge our space in the center, and B, finally free their own bishop. It'd be a genius way to solve everything. So what does white do? Knight a4. Now hold up a second. Before you accuse me of just making random one-move attacks, this has nothing to do with the knight, and it is kind of a random one-move attack. But the whole point of this move is that it gains time. The fact is, black doesn't have time to play d5. Black wants that black would like to do. Uh, black needs to do something else, like save the queen. So they save the queen, and then we get to play c4. Ta-da! What a perfectly timed move that A gains more space and makes use of our advantage. And B prevents the opponent from fixing their own problems. Like, I'm telling you, everybody, if you can start looking at master games after this, and just even like a, on a really basic level, you're going to sound so smart to your friends. I'm sure you already are smart, but you're just not even more smart to your friends. You'd be like, hey, in the, like, let's uh, obviously they have to understand chess. Otherwise, you just sound like, you know, it's just gibberish. But hey, in this position, white's got an advantage in space or the center or active pieces. Um, you know, watch how they use those things to hurt their opponent um, by, you know, increasing them and, and striking with them. So again, this is a build-up move. It is increasing our edge in space by gaining more territory. And uh, yeah, the game goes on. Um, I'm not sure if I can perfectly remember everything about this game. I'm going to try. Um, there's a lot of complicated calculation, obviously, that goes into it. Um, but if I remember correctly, I believe that white decides that having knights on the edge of the board is not to be recommended. No? Oh, yeah, that's it. I remember now. So, white... Uh... On f4, it's okay. Find the moves. Just use your space. Yeah, um, f4 is not bad. It's honestly not bad. Um, it says it's not tactically fatal, but it takes away some options, namely f3, and it leaves some uh, open, you know, dials. Now again, don't worry if the thing says you're wrong. Okay, I'm gonna tell you right now. And if you're playing a real game of chess against a real opponent that's not a master, doesn't matter, whatever, and you're like, Jesse told me I'm supposed to create, improve, and use differences and advantages to hurt my opponent. My biggest plus is pushed pawns. I'm going to push even more pawns. If it fails, I still want you to feel so good about yourself. Because, again, you have to start somewhere. It's like trying to juggle, okay? Just because you drop the bags or whatever you're juggling doesn't mean that you should stop trying. It just means you didn't do it great the first time. If you play F4 in your own game, you should be proud of yourself.
because again you understand you're trying to gain more space um and i also like the fact that it takes away e5 from that knight but alas in this position we want to be slow with this i suppose you can make the argument that you can't take pawn pushes back so you know why rush it white plays king h1 here why because if we're gonna start pushing the f pawn and even the g pawn we should get our king out of there before any diagonals open up to him or nasty things like that, right? Pawn f6. Black's just kind of creating this fortress at this point. There's several ways we could play here. I think it might be knight c5 yet. Nope, not. Still not? Still not? Did he play the queen c2 move? Oh yeah, this is uh, for uh, Han shot. So, funny enough, it turns out that this move is tactically flawed, although I would never expect anyone to see this. Apparently, queen b1 is more accurate, so the queen doesn't get smacked around. It really doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Knight c3, finally. Again, we, the, the reason I kept trying to play that is I never wanted to play knight a4. Knight a4 had nothing to do with being a better spot for my knight or increasing my space advantage or anything. It was just a move I had to play to quickly get that c4 push in. So we're fixing our issues. We're not ignoring them. Our opponent is dancing around, dancing around, dancing around. What do we do? Again, I'm telling you in this game, he's not going to go for here. If I remember correctly, he goes for g4. And perhaps the reason he goes for g4 is this. And maybe this is another advanced technique you're going to have to realize. In this position, if white eventually wants to win, white's going to have to have a breakthrough. A breakthrough is when the pawns and the and the position finally open pathways so that the pieces can finally stream across the board and cause massive damage and win some pieces, checkmate, all sorts of things. So as white is thinking about this position and thinking, how do I gain more space slowly like an anaconda and suffocate my opponent? White is also thinking about where am I eventually going to trade pawns with my opponent in order to open up pathways to attack? And I think one of the things that white sees is this bishop aiming over here. If white can eventually play some idea like g4, rook g3, h3, h4, g5, and trade a g pawn for the f6 pawn, and then the knight moves, it could open up all sorts of damage in the direction of Black's King. So I think that, the, I mean, G4 is not like the only way you can go for it, but here's the lesson, okay? In addition to building up your advantage and making use of it and trying to hurt your opponent with it, eventually to attack, you have to plan a break, right? Um, Hansad says, why not uh, Rook G3 or, or D5 maybe? Yeah, and also, again, part of the reason is, is that rook g3... Rook g3 is an aggressive-looking move, but, w like, what is your plan here? We have to do more than have aggressive-looking moves. Like, we have to actually have a, a plan to strike. g4 is going to open up the position more. g4, queen a5, hitting that, I guess. Um, not sure I want to play the wrong move here. I'm not sure if it's h4 or rook g1. Rook g1, no. H4, no. Interesting. Uh, is it rook g3? No, it's not. Oh, I always, I always get this move wrong because it's just a temporary move. Queen d1. The only purpose of this is so that we can move our rook on g to g3 without having to deal with this pin and the tactical fallout that might happen. Well, also, you know, the queen on a5 was hinting I might play d5, so it, it does take control of that. Fast forward. No? There it is. Again, I don't want to bog all of you down with the complications that went into why he decided on exactly the precise move orders. That's for a different time. Instead, what I really want you to focus on is white started out with this advantage, and then if you watch how the game transforms, it's not an accident when you see that side gaining more and more of that advantage and eventually using it as a weapon to hurt your opponent. Like, that is the consistent theme I want you to see here. So again, probably rook to g3, f3, so we don't even have to worry about that anymore. 
And we might even play, you know, and then here, you know, our opponents fairly help us again. Um, we have a few ideas here. We could bring the rook over here. We could play g5. We could play knight e2 to d4 to f5, so we could open all that up. I mean, all of these are fairly reasonable ideas. Knight e2, sure, why not? Knight e2 here, double the rooks, sure. And then again, it's all around. And again, let's just look at this position. I told you before that the purpose of having a space advantage is that it gives you a lot of room to move your pieces and not very much room to, for your opponent to move their pieces. I told you that using this is kind of like being an anaconda, where you slowly strangle your opponent and they choke. This is exactly what's happening. Remember how I also told you not to trade pieces. If you had traded pieces, your opponent's position wouldn't be this smashed. You had to let them stew in their own juices. You know, I kind of like that. I've never gotten to really use that, uh, that phrase before in a chess game. Uh, I like that. I'm going to use it again. But uh, no, it's bad here. Like, life is pretty bad. And it's just a matter of time before we have a breakthrough. And then everything just comes crashing through. You know, knight f5, maybe rook takes g5. Everything is just crashing through at this point. And, you know f4 yeah like that we can do whatever we really want here um but the point is is that we we used we we saw our advantage we increased it we played the strategy accordingly and slowly but surely we suffocated our opponent then we made a breakthrough and boom boom pow 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 okay right Again, I don't want you to get bogged down with the complications. I want you to focus on the advantage and making it better and using it to hurt your opponent with it. Okay? Oh, this isn't really important. It's just showing like why the queen shouldn't be here. It's because of it's because of d5 and this weird variation where everything gets traded off and you can't play knight takes d5 because of the pin. And then eventually you play queen g3. And black was able to sacrifice a pawn temporarily in order to trade off almost all the pieces so that guess who's not cramped anymore, right? Anyways. Oh. Uh, this is not a good example for teaching what we're trying to teach here today. This is actually more of a defensive planning position. Um, yeah, we'll skip this one for now. Oh, one of my favorite examples of uh, using plans. Okay. Hey, guess what? I'm going to give you all a big hint. All right. I want this is all your challenge. I want you all to try and find the right plan. Okay. And remember, so again, in order to find the right plan, you need to figure out what are the advantages, the the pluses, the good things for me in this position. And likewise, what are the bad things for my opponent? Because those are the things you're trying to make use of. And then you're, you're, then you're trying to figure out, can I make use of any of those things? And I'm going to tell you, there's already a lot of imbalances in this position. Okay? White has a space advantage on the king side. Maybe we should make a plan to gain more space. Okay? Um, there's all sorts of things. Black has a space advantage on the queen side. Maybe we should try to gain more space. Black's got a half-open C file. Maybe they can make use of it. This is how chess works. But to save you all a bunch of time, here is the imbalance that matters. I know you're probably thinking I'm crazy right now because I just highlighted an empty square. But... That empty square right there, my friends, is known as an outpost. An outpost is a great location to sink one of your pieces for a long time. And white would love to use this square for our own pieces. Can anybody in here make the right idea for black or for white in order to... I'll tell you right now. Well, no, I won't get... No, never mind. I'm not going to give you too much details. Too many hints. See what you come up with. Huh? 
Anshot says, plug the center horsey with knight d5. Yeah, I, I, I would like to do that. But I'll tell you right now, if I do that right away, it's going to lead to an exchange of pieces. So, like, they'll just take, 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 take. And I don't actually get to keep a horsey on d5. And since I don't get to keep him, I'm not interested. How can we make a plan so that when we put a knight on this square someday, it will get to stay there forever, forever, and ever, and ever, and ever, and ever. Because I don't want to go out of my way and put a piece on a great square and achieve a nice plan just so that my opponent instantly trades it off and gets rid of it. I mean, what fun is that? I want to get something nice that I can keep and use. Rook d1? I mean, rook d1 definitely would activate the rook more and it would increase pressure on d5. However... I, I don't see how rook d1 is going to help you eventually put a knight in d5 where it actually just gets to sit there and stay there. It's like, I mean, like, let's just say you play rook d1 and then you play knight d5. Well, they still just take, 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 take. It didn't get to stay, did it, right? I'm looking for a plan that'll allow me to let my knight stay. Well, let's think about this a little bit more, shall we? Like, uh... What are the pieces that, uh... Bishop g5? Why? Why, oh, why should we bishop g5? You know, you're actually right. There you go. You see, here's the deal. I want to put that knight there, but when it goes there, I want to stay there. At the moment, these two pieces will destroy me if I go there. Anything else has no interest in destroying me because they can't or they don't want to. So, if we can get rid of these two pieces, we do. Bishop g5. Perfect. Queen b6 check. Do we block with here? Absolutely not. We just play here. They can't really avoid this trade. I mean, they could play the knight move, but then we take on e7. The king can't castle. It's a mess. So they castle, and what do we do? Of course, we snap off that knight. The, uh, pinning the, uh, bishop to off, and then we sink our knight in there. Well, actually, he should have sunk his knight in there. Instead, for some reason, Bobby Fischer played the useless rook a d1 move. I know. How could I possibly, um, maybe he didn't want to allow queen d1, or d4, as a response to knight d5. I'm not sure. I doubt that. I don't know. Either way, rook d1 was unnecessary. Um, we're going to play knight to d5, and the knight's going to sit on d5, and it's going to block the d-file, which makes putting pieces on the d-file pointless. Knight, or rook c8, knight d5. Yay, we did it! Do you know that a plan like this is worth a million dollars? It really is. White made a plan to forcibly get this knight on d5 in a situation where black cannot 
get rid of it unless they want to sacrifice a rook. And as a bonus, black is left with this. This bishop on f f6. My coach used to call this a tall pawn. Jeremy Silliman would call this a very bad inactive bishop. Okay? Later on in the game, all we had to do was shut down the rooks. And then what do we do? Well, we make a new plan. Right? In chess, you should always have a plan. So in this position, white decided, okay, what do I do? White has a lot of good ideas. White has an advantage in space on the king side. It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world if, if white wanted to try and play for g5 and f6. But playing for g5 is really tough with all the bishop and queen aiming over there like that. Instead, Bobby Fischer comes up with a different way to activate and create pressure against the opponent. Knowing that the center is locked up, we turn our attention to the wings. Rook a1. You know, another imbalance we have that it's, we don't talk about enough is uh, white has a pawn majority. On the queen side, white has a three on two pawn majority. So actually, um, playing over there and exchanging pawns and creating targets might eventually lead to the creation of a pass pawn. F6. Oh man, that's one really, really sad bishop. A4 threatening here. Rook b8. Now this is an important moment. I don't know if you'd believe this, but black is a master here. And yet black has just played an atrocious move. Absolutely awful. Totally losing. Bobby Fischer is going to make black resign very quickly now. However, you can't blame black too much. Look at the position before this. They have the most ugly bishop in the world, while white has the most amazing knight. And in addition, white just keeps attacking us and pressuring us. And it doesn't seem like it's going to stop now or anytime soon. And if it wasn't bad enough, our opponent's Bobby Fischer. In this position, due to stress and fatigue, which is the number one enemy, I guess two, top two enemies of a chess player, uh, black falters. Black stops protecting the rook on c6. And in a million years, I would never recommend that you take that bishop with that knight. That bishop is the most horrific thing ever, and that knight is beautiful. Maybe that's why our master didn't see it coming. But when the, this stop covering here, check captures and threats with mostly checks. Knight takes e7 check, leads to queen d5 check, picking off an entire rook. And that's how Fisher won this game. But even if he didn't, even if Black had not fallen for that tactic and taken on a4, Bobby Fischer would have continued to take back, target a now isolated a pawn. Bobby Fischer would have continued to make plans by creating and using imbalances. Remember, imbalances is that magic word, which is any key difference between white and black's position. Remember, um, some of the main categories for imbalances are uh, space, which we looked at today, uh, uh, development, having more active pieces, which we looked at today, pawn structure, which we kind of looked at today. Um, uh, what else is there? Oh, we said oh, space and center control. Uh, there's also control of open files and squares. There is the battle between bishops and knights. There is um, initiative. And there's one more. That's eluding me now. Wonderful. Control of key files and squares. There's something else there. It'll come to me eventually. Anyways. Yeah. Um... Your job in chess is to create an advantage and to build it up and to use it as a weapon against your opponent. Chess can really be that simple. How do you explain Alpha Zero's pawn sacrifices for initiative? I think you just explained it right there. Um, Alpha Zero found a way to create and make use of imbalances, in that case, initiative, right? And at that level, I mean, at, at, at most players' levels, which is like, you know, less than 1,400, you could just robotically focus on creating your own advantages and making use of them, and you could do pretty decently. But obviously, at a top level and at alpha zero level, um, chess is so complicated. It's a constant bal uh, balancing act of all the different factors, sacrificing one factor. Oh, that was the factor I didn't list. Material. 
sacrificing material, pawns, pieces, points, in exchange for a different imbalance and saying, I think that this will outweigh the other ones. I mean, yeah, tough stuff. Anyway, been doing this for a bit, and I uh, hope you guys have enjoyed. I'm going to get a snack and probably chill out and go to bed. But I uh, hope you all enjoyed this for a bit. And uh, see you guys soon. And uh, yeah, check out my channel. Like, subscribe. All those good things. You know, makes me feel good. All right. Love you. Bye.